My name is Sanjay Gupta. Today's video is on the subject of blood pressure, balloons and hot water bottles. Okay, so let's get started. Now the whole subject of blood pressure is poorly understood, poorly taught and poorly managed. Today I wanted to try and simplify the subject using the analogy of balloons and hot water bottles. Now, the first thing is, what is high blood pressure? Now, I was, once upon a time, uh, giving a lecture and there were clinicians present from Europe as well as America. And I asked the question, what is high blood pressure? And the Americans in the audience said, anything higher than 120 over 80 is high. The Europeans said, anything above 140 over 90 is high. So my response was, well, if this is the case, if what both of you are saying is true, then why don't we pay for all the American hypertensives, i.e. who have blood pressures of up to 139 over 89, to get a one-way ticket to Europe and encourage them to settle there? That would cure their hypertension because 139 over 89 is not considered high in Europe, but it is considered high in America. This would cure their hypertension without subjecting them to a lifetime of medications. How ludicrous is it that a chronic condition can be cured by simply moving a patient to a different continent? The definition of high blood pressure is not a number. The definition of high blood pressure should be that blood pressure that does that individual some form of harm. If it is not doing you any harm, then it is not high for you. And if we think about it this way, we can start to understand how ridiculous the whole notion of taking the whole population and calibrating them against a single set of numbers is. And ironically, this number changes every few years because the so-called experts change their mind every few years. Another point to mention is that high blood pressure is important for two reasons. The high blood pressure is a symptom of something else going on in the body in which case you want to treat and identify the thing that is underlying the high blood pressure readings. In some way, if you don't do this and just treat the number, you are doing the patient a disservice because you have simply silenced a scream for help. Something else is causing the blood pressure to be high. The blood pressure is the scream. And instead of looking for underlying factors, you're just silencing the scream. That will do the patient a disservice because you haven't tackled the underlying issue and the underlying issue will manifest with some sort of harm later on. Secondly, the blood pressure numbers themselves are causing you some kind of harm, in which case treating and lowering the numbers does make sense. Now, most of modern day management of blood pressure concerns itself with simply lowering the number and not identifying or tackling the underlying causes. And this is perhaps why, despite all the emphasis on hitting the numbers hard with pills, it has not really made a huge difference to the incidence of complications such as heart attacks, strokes and kidney failure. Whilst I'm confident that some people do benefit from having their numbers aggressively reduced to the cutoffs defined by the experts, I am also very confident that a ton of patients end up being over-medicated unnecessarily and have to endure the indignity of carrying an incorrect label of hypertension, suffer the extra costs of medications and insurance, and worst of all, put up with possible side effects of a shed load of pills. This is perhaps why the Americans keep reducing the thresholds for treatment, because they're not identifying the root cause of the problem, such as sugar, obesity, and stress. As it is too difficult and perhaps unprofitable to reduce sugar and stress, let's just hit the blood pressure numbers a bit more. That is actually quite a profitable thing to do. And the best thing is that the, if the patient doesn't have a heart attack or a stroke, then we will say it is because of our excellent tablets. And if they did, then we would say, well, that was because you have high blood pressure and you need even more medications. Uh, either way, it's a win for us, a win for uh, the pharmaceutical company, a win for uh, virtually everyone in the insurance companies as well. So... How do we resolve this? Well, firstly, we have to understand what is blood pressure. 
Ultimately, the whole concept of blood pressure is that when the heart pumps blood out, it has to generate enough pressure within our circulatory system to be able to perfuse our vital organs with oxygen-rich blood. If the pressure is too low, the blood doesn't get to our vital organs, and this results in suffocation and death of important cells in our vital organs. If the pressure is too high, then there is a risk of damaging our most fragile blood vessels by causing them to burst. This then leads them to heal by clotting off, which means that again our vital organs are deprived of blood and therefore get damaged. If your pressure is not doing you any damage, then it is not high for you. Physiologically, the formula to calculate pressure is force over area. So if the force that is exerted over a constant area is doubled, then the pressure is doubled. If the force stays the same, but the area is halved, then the pressure will again double. When we measure the blood pressure, we usually measure two values. So typically we get a measurement of, let's say, 130 over 80. 130 is the systolic pressure, 80 is the diastolic pressure. Now, the systolic pressure is when the heart is pumping and ejecting blood into the vascular system. And therefore, this is the highest pressure that the circulation will be exposed to. And the diastolic pressure is when the heart is relaxing and filling with blood and therefore the lowest pressure within our circulation. Now, I want to use it. I want to explain this by using a balloon. OK, so let me show you. So let me blow uh, some air in this balloon. All right. I hope I can do it. <laughs> Let's see. OK. So this is the systolic pressure in this balloon is governed by how much force I exert into pushing air into the balloon and the stretchability of the balloon. If I blow harder and faster, then the balloon is more likely to burst. Similarly, if the balloon was less stretchy and more like a hot water bottle, then the pressure in the balloon would be much higher for the same amount of force as a more stretchy balloon, right? So basically the pressure, I can regulate the pressure, I can change the pressure either by blowing harder, by blowing faster or making the balloon less stretchy like a hot water bottle. So within our vascular system, our blood vessel, the blood pressure will therefore depend on how much blood is ejected into our vascular compartment, i.e. our balloon, and in that sense will depend on our heart rate, how fast we're blowing in, how much blood is being pushed out with each heartbeat, i.e. how much of a breath I'm taking to blow in, and therefore, and this is called the stroke volume. So if our heart rate increases, our blood pressure will increase. If the amount of blood in our heart increases, the blood of, amount of blood ejecting our heart with each heartbeat increases, such as if you take too much salt, then again, our blood pressure will increase. These are, however, physiological changes. Our heart rate varies all day long, so our blood pressure will change accordingly and therefore will vary all day long. Our hydration status changes all day long, so our blood pressure will change all day long. This is why our blood pressure may go up when we're stressed or exercising or even when we go to our doctor's surgery. The more important determinant, however, of blood pressure is the stiffness of the blood vessels. How stiff is the balloon? Is it like a balloon? Is it more stiff like a hot water bottle? Now, as we get older or, you know, if there's inflammation within the body or disease states, then our blood vessels start getting harder and therefore we start transforming, our vascular system starts transforming from a nice compliant balloon to a much stiffer balloon, almost like a hot water bottle. Then all those physiological variations in our heart rate, our stroke volume, are applied over a stiffer surface and therefore the pressures are significantly magnified. Because the systolic pressure is the highest pressure in the vascular compartment, it is logical to say that this is the number which is more likely to do you harm as it is the highest pressure that our vessels are going to be exposed to. Now, the diastolic pressure, on the other hand, is when the heart is not pumping blood into the vessels and therefore the diastolic pressure is not subject or not governed by the heart rate or the stroke volume, but is largely a measure of the elastic recoil of the vessel. So look at this. So if I blow in here, 
that was the systolic pressure and now we have the diastolic pressure. So the pressure in this balloon now is the diastolic pressure and that pressure is being governed by the elastic recoil of this balloon, of, this, of, the, of the balloon itself. You know, if the balloon is very stretchy, the recoil force is going to be high and therefore the pressure in this balloon is gonna be higher. This is why if I let this balloon go, it will just fly off. Whereas if I take a stiffer balloon, although it's taking, I'm exerting a lot more pressure pushing air in, if I let go, the balloon does not fly off because it is the very nature of something which is stiff that it is not going to have as much of a recoil force. And therefore, if you have very stiff vessels, the recoil force is low. And therefore, the stiffer your blood vessels, the lower your diastolic pressure. So the stiffer your vascular system, the higher the systolic pressure, but paradoxically, the lower the diastolic pressure. Now, diastole is important because during diastole, we fill our heart arteries with blood and we still need a good diastolic pressure to keep blood going to our brains. And this is why when our diastolic blood pressure starts falling, particularly as we get older, we become more prone to falls. Now, one of the biggest problems about using this one set of values that the experts decide on treating the whole world is that a change in blood pressure is a consequence of aging. We do need a higher blood pressure when we're older compared to when we're younger, because our vessels, just like the rest of us, get stiffer. In some ways, just going and treating the number in a 70-year-old like you would in a 30-year-old is completely illogical and actually harmful because in the 70-year-old, you risk lowering the diastolic blood pressure even further, which means less blood gets to the heart and the brain, and this increases the risk of coronary and cerebral underperfusion. By lowering the diastolic even further, you're actually propagating the problem. Remember, when you get stiffer, your diastolic falls. So you don't want to lower it even further. And therefore, you are increasing the chances of causing harm to that patient. So how do we go about sorting this mess out? Uh, how do we decide what our blood pressure is and whether it needs any management? Well, number one, work out what your numbers are. As the numbers are so variable, it is important to have one set of numbers. And this is why it is always good to start off with an ambulatory blood pressure monitor. This is different to having one of those home blood pressure machines. The ambulatory blood pressure monitor will automatically measure your blood pressure every half an hour during the waking hours. And more importantly, it will measure your blood pressure every hour when you are asleep. And your sleep blood pressure is perhaps the best marker of your blood pressure because you're eliminating many of the confounding variables such as stress, exercise when you're sleeping you will then end up with an average reading, i.e. one set of numbers to compare with the one set of numbers that the experts tell you to live and die by. Ideally, I would do this off all blood pressure medications. And then if you need blood pressure medications, then I would repeat the ambulatory blood pressure monitor whilst you're on the medication so that at least you're comparing apples with apples and are in a position to work out exactly what the medication that you're taking has done for your numbers. Number two, remember high blood pressure is that pressure that does you harm and therefore look for evidence of harm as your tiniest, most fragile vessels are the ones that are most susceptible to becoming damaged if the pressure is too high, it is important to study these. Well, these can be visualized in the retina at the back of the eyes and patients with True hypertension will often have evidence of small bleeding in the retina. Um, they're called flame-shaped hemorrhages, cotton wool spots in the back of the eye. If you have these, your number is too high for you, regardless of what the number is, right? That's really important. So you may be misled into thinking, oh, well, my number is within normal limits, so I don't have high blood pressure. Well, that number still may be too high for you. So look for evidence of harm. Similarly, we can also study the kidneys. If the tiny blood vessels in the kidneys get damaged, then the kidneys don't function as well, which means that they start leaking out protein. And this can be measured very easily using a simple urine test called 24-hour urinary microalbumin levels. 
finally, the heart is a muscle. And as with any muscle, if it is constantly working against a higher pressure, it becomes more muscular. And this can easily be visualized on a heart scan. Virtually all data suggests that people who have evidence of harm in this manner are the ones that are exposed to a risk of heart attacks and strokes later on. So look for harm. Number three, always work on lifestyle first. Medications just reduce the number. Lifestyle helps in keeping your blood vessels more stretchy and therefore works on the underlying problem. Lifestyle includes nutrition, tackling habits like smoking and excessive alcohol, working on improving sleep patterns, and most importantly, managing stress. Number four, do not stress over isolated high diastolic readings. If your vascular system is not being damaged by your systolic pressure, i.e. the higher pressure, then it is definitely not going to be damaged by your diastolic pressure, which by definition is obviously much lower. So if your balloon is not going to be, uh, is not going to burst when actually you're blowing air in, then it is highly unlikely that the balloon will burst when you're not blowing air in. Uh, so again, a lot of people will say, I'm really worried about my lower number. My high number is okay, but my lower number is on the high side. Don't worry about it. It's not going to do you any harm. I hope this helps. I would love your thoughts. Remember, the only reason that ambulatory blood pressure is not being used more widely is cost. It is the most accurate way at present to measure and manage your blood pressure. And I, in my practice, will often post a machine to my patients before they come and see me so that at least I'm dealing with accurate data. I don't really care about doing blood pressure readings in my clinic because I don't know what to make of them. And in some ways, I also think that those people who have blood pressure machines at home well, every time you measure your blood pressure, you'll get a different value. So how does that move for, How does that move you forward? Far better to do a 24-hour blood pressure monitor once. If your readings are high, if your readings are normal and you don't have any evidence of harm, don't bother doing your blood pressures. If your readings are high and there is evidence of harm, treat through lifestyle and medications and then repeat the ambulatory blood pressure monitor. So thank you so much. I uh, hope you found this useful. I am more grateful than you will ever realize. Uh, and um, yeah, it's, it's autumn now. So I hope you're having a lovely autumn's afternoon. Thank you.